Good evening all, and welcome. When chatting to people online who you don't know, you never really know who you're gonna get. So get ready, because it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I worked in a residential care facility and for a number of years worked with a woman named Kajiri. She was generally okay to work with, but she could be intense. The sort of joking flirtation that often finds its way into high pressure environments was common throughout the whole team. But when she directed it at me, it didn't seem so jokey. It took me forever to realize that because I usually don't notice someone flirting with me until someone else points it out six months later. But when she started trying to give me jewelry and chocolate bouquets, I finally caught a clue. In between things being normal and actually maybe not really normal, there was a long escalation of text messages, comments that made me uncomfortable, personal space violations, dropping by my house uninvited, hanging around on my shift hours after hers had finished, and unwanted touching. As mentioned, I can be slow to catch on. Once I realized what was happening, I put as much distance between us as possible. I stopped answering calls and texts, locked down social media, and spoke to other colleagues and had them running interference. A lot of interference, actually. At the time, it kind of became a joke, but looking back, it was all kinds of messed up. She even parked outside my house sometimes, and I'd sit in the back room with the lights off so she'd think I wasn't home. Honestly, 2019 me is looking back at 2016 me, throwing popcorn and screaming, do something, you stupid cow. But hey, I was alarmingly chill back then. After a couple of months of my disappearing woman act, she seemed to get the hint and backed off. I was pleased. We all got on with our lives and lived happily ever after. Right? No. A few months after it died down, I heard through the grapevine that Kajiri seemed to have focused her attention on another co-worker, Linda. Linda and I had a close mutual friendship, but didn't know each other well. I didn't think much of it beyond, good luck, you poor girl. A few months later, and I get a call out of the blue from the mutual friend Linda and I share. Without preamble, he asked, were you dating Kajiri? Uh, no. I was shocked. He had been privy to all the awkward details of my experience with Kajiri and had helped run interference. He explained that he had been talking to Linda and she'd asked about my relationship. The story that followed still sounds too fantastical to have actually happened in an actual sensible grown-up workplace. Kajiri had been catfishing her own best friend Amanda posing as Linda. In a string of emails, Linda and Amanda had discussed Kajiri's drug problem, her abusive and dangerous sex, none other than yours truly, and Linda coming out to her family after her brother caught her in bed with Kajiri and more. The jig was up when Linda got a second job, coincidentally with Amanda's husband, who mentioned how great it was to finally meet Kajiri's girlfriend. Which puzzled poor, straight, single Linda. Some highlights of the stories Kajiri had been telling to Linda, her friends, and other co-workers I wasn't close to, as she picked her audience very carefully. That Linda and I had physically fought at work over Kajiri. That two male co-workers, Kajiri and I, had an orgy in the staff office on a midnight shift. That Kajiri and I had broken up after I cheated on her with another male co-worker. 
and I was really getting around, apparently. That I would drug her against her will, and that we had planned to have children using a donor, but that I had had a miscarriage. This woman had been living out a full-on soap opera, and using her co-workers and friends as set pieces. Linda and I reported her to management, and she was immediately suspended pending investigation. She quit two days later. Unfortunately, HR decided they needed to continue their investigation of the allegation that I had an orgy at work, because that was totally plausible and not made up by a crazy woman, right? I left that job a month later myself, and when I interviewed for my current job, she had interviewed half hour before me, and they were looking for two people. She didn't get the job, but there have been two openings since, and she has applied for both of them. I'm terrified of meeting her again. It turned out she has a history of inpatient psychiatric treatment for delusional behavior, and was known to be obsessive about people she took a liking to. According to Facey, her current girlfriend, whether that be real or not, has a similar first name to me, and shares more than a few physical similarities. She still knows where I live. This happened before catfishing became a widely used term, though the act itself has been around as long as social media has. This was back during my freshman year of college, and it was during the MySpace era. In college, I made friends with someone in my honors colloquium class, Leslie, and she in turn introduced me to her other friends, who then became my friends. They'd all known each other for years, but were very welcoming to me, and I felt very much like a part of the group. That being said, I didn't really know them that well when this happened. What they did seemed, well, not like them. But then I realized I didn't exactly know what was like them. A member of the group, Catherine, was going away to school in Boston. And so the night before, we all decided to have a going away party of sorts. We were going to visit another friend, Tamara, who was going to school in Philadelphia, which was about an hour away, and then we were just going to have fun in the city. Our designated meeting place to drive down there was a Dunkin' Donuts. When I arrived, Leslie was there with our friends, Samantha and Anthony. Leslie looked pissed. She was sitting there with her arms crossed, staring at nothing, with an angry look plastered on her face. As for Samantha and Anthony, they kept looking at the door, and they seemed nervous and shifty. I could tell they were on edge. I sat down at the table of awkwardness since we had to wait on Catherine and a couple of other friends, and things got awkward when no one was talking. Finally, I just said it. What's the deal with you three? Leslie just replied, You should ask them, gesturing to Anthony and Samantha. They suddenly looked guilty, but before they could answer, the door opened again, and they both went from looking guilty to anxious and mildly scared. I looked at the door and just saw a normal guy, pretty nondescript, when he walked in, he just kind of glanced around the room, like he was looking for someone. Anthony and Samantha wouldn't say anything. Leslie just kept huffing and shaking her head. And all three of them kept looking over at this guy as he sat down. As soon as Catherine and the others got there, it was like we couldn't get out of there fast enough. Catherine, our friends Evan and Julie and I were very confused. It was on the way to Philadelphia that we learned the truth. It was Leslie who told us. Apparently, Anthony and Samantha had created a fake MySpace account, and they'd been catfishing this guy, Calvin. 
We didn't know the term catfishing yet, but that is what it was. They had created a fake account using a picture of an actress or a singer or something. I can't remember. Only her face was obscured. Apparently, this had been going on for a couple of weeks, and the conversations had gotten serious. Like Calvin seemed to really like this fake girl they had created. I didn't know why they did this, and when I asked them, they didn't really have a reason. Mostly, they were just bored. It turned out that they told him to meet at the Dunkin' Donuts at the time we were there. I think that once he showed up, Anthony and Samantha realized that this wasn't just a game. That Calvin was a real person with real feelings, and I do think they felt bad about what they had done. But it was too late. They couldn't take it back. There was no reason they had chosen Calvin. He was just some random guy they had picked. I guess Leslie had found out about it a few days before, and told them to end it. And that was why she was so upset and angry with them. Because they had told her what had happened. That Calvin was supposed to be there. After that, I never really saw Anthony and Samantha in the same way. These weren't really people I wanted to be friends with. Especially when I saw the messages and saw how much they had gotten Calvin to like him. I thought this would be the end of it, but I was wrong. About a week later, everyone came to my house for pizza, and just to hang out, and Samantha and Anthony told us they had gotten messages from Calvin. I didn't think much of it, because I already knew he had been messaging their fake accounts, wanting to know why she had stood him up and he seemed upset, especially when this fake girl stopped replying. But no, that wasn't what Samantha and Anthony meant. He hadn't messaged the fake account. He had messaged their accounts. I remember them telling me that. My sharp intake of breath, the way my heart rate increased, that unnerved me. The messages were more of the same, but also Calvin made it clear he knew what they had done, and he seemed even angrier. Anthony in particular got a very long, furious message from him. I don't want to say that I thought they deserved it, but honestly they had done a shitty thing, and there were some consequences. And I figured it would die down in a few days. It didn't. A few days after Calvin had messaged Anthony and Samantha, he started messaging the rest of us who'd been drinking in the Dunkin' Donuts. Now this really scared me. Keep in mind that I was already dealing with my other stalker situation, so I was understandably on edge. And this guy had found me. I didn't know much about computers, but I thought he must have traced Anthony and Samantha's IP or something, since they'd used their own computers for the account. But when it came to the rest of us, we didn't understand. How had he found us? My theory is that once he found Anthony and Samantha, he looked through their friends and recognized us from pictures, but I can't say for sure. All of his messages came on MySpace, so at least he wasn't texting us and stuff. But still, his messages were very angry. He kept saying things like, How could you do this to me? You made a fool out of me. I thought about replying, but Evan had done that already, telling Calvin that we weren't responsible, and he didn't believe him. Honestly, Evan totally sold Anthony and Samantha out, but we figured that Calvin already knew that they were the ringleaders. He just didn't know they were the sole perpetrators, instead, thinking we all had a hand in it. I figured there was no point to defend myself since Calvin didn't believe Evan when he had tried. This went on for a few weeks, and it seemed like Calvin was getting increasingly angrier the more we ignored him, because that's what he said we were doing. Finally, I had enough. I replied and told him again that we weren't responsible, corroborating Evan's story. I didn't actually put all the blame on Anthony and Samantha, but I told Calvin that it was just a couple of people in the group, then I apologized, although that only made him angrier. 
He didn't believe anything we said, so I blocked him. We all did. But he just kept making new accounts. In two weeks, he probably made three different profiles, in addition to the one he had at the beginning. When I finally defended myself, Calvin messaged me back and said, You made me into a fool, an idiot, and one day you'll know how that feels. I think you will. Maybe it was because of everything else that had happened with this guy, but that sounded like a threat. Like he was going to personally make sure we knew how we had made him feel. We were lucky. As far as I know, Calvin never did do anything beyond message us aggressively, and it could have been a lot worse. He eventually did stop, and then he deleted his account. I felt bad for the guy, and Anthony and Samantha had been wrong. But what Calvin was doing to us was wrong too, the harassment. Eventually he stopped though after a few months, and we never saw him again. I slowly drifted apart from the group, first Anthony and Samantha for obvious reasons, then Catherine, Julie, Evan and Leslie. I wasn't too broken up about the first two because they weren't the kind of people I really wanted to be friends with. Not only had they done shitty things, they'd brought Calvin into our lives, and it was like opening a door and inviting someone in. Four years ago, I met this girl called Carrie. We actually met online, and we had a mutual friend called Fred. I used to live with abusive family, so I had to run away to live with Fred, and I happened to have a crush on Fred. And then I discovered that Carrie happens to have a crush on him too. All three of us were talking normally, until Carrie introduced us to her psychiatrist, Enzo. Whenever we used to talk to her, she was always depressed and wanted to kill herself. And Enzo diagnosed her with schizophrenia, or schizoaffective disorder. Like once she wanted to throw herself from the window, or the time she went insane and hysterically crying, and Enzo had to tranquilize her. There is always something wrong with her. And because we were her family, we wanted to help her. And she also told us about her breast cancer that happened because of her depression. One of the moments she wanted to kill herself is when she was hospitalized for her heart condition. Something happened, and then we hear from Enzo, who was visiting her at the time, that she actually jumped from the third floor of the hospital. She'd broken ribs and a twisted shoulder, and was discharged four or five days later, without getting admitted to a psychiatric for her suicide attempt. Actually, a lot of times we hear from Enzo that he's going to admit her from a psychiatric hospital, but he didn't. A few months later, she stabbed herself because I told her to improve or else she is no longer my friend. She tells me that she can't, and I tell her that it was nice knowing her, and then we get a message from Enzo that Carrie actually stabbed herself and that she is rushed to the hospital because she lost a lot of blood. She needed a blood transfusion, and Enzo was her donor because there wasn't enough blood in the blood bank. After two days, she was discharged, again without getting admitted to psychiatric care. A few weeks after the incident, we told us to show her her scar. She refused, and said that there weren't any. Every time when we went to speak to her, we had to be very careful on what to say, or else she'll go nuts, especially regarding her hallucinations. The thing is, we didn't discover this for almost a year, that Enza was actually Carrie the entire time. She didn't jump from the hospital window, nor had she stabbed herself. She never even had breast cancer, and never had schizophrenia either. And what was her excuse? I just wanted to express myself through Enzo that I couldn't as Carrie. We caught her when Enzo actually told us that he wanted to kill her and that Carrie was his lab rat, and that he was done with her. We seriously found that so fishy, so we googled his full name and found nothing. We even went to ask people, from the same country she lived in, 
about the list of psychiatrists there, and we found nothing. And she also went on to create at least five to six more other people. She went back to tell her friends about us, ditching her for catfishing. Her friends went to attack us, and apparently she slept with Fred and got pregnant, even though she told him that she was on birth control. Then she had to abort it, and now her friends are blaming her for making her abort it. They also went on attacking me, calling me a goat because I carry an Arab nationality. And they even threatened to tell my family about my whereabouts. And I also got attacked for lying about my age. That's what jealousy does to people, to the point where they catfish and manipulate others. Back in 2013, I was living with my ex at the time, who lived near a nice country village, and I was in between jobs at the time. I picked up a job at a local garden center. It was casual retail work, fairly decent pay, and easy going enough that I could take coffee breaks frequently and wear basically whatever I liked as long as I wore my work polo shirt. I was working distance from my ex's house and full of people of all ages who were the most lovely people I'd ever met. Most of the regular customers who came into the garden center were usually sweet old people who would visit the cafe because we had free teas and discounted lunches for old age pensioners if they had a store card. You could often get to know all of them, and some of them we even gave nicknames to. Most of them were like Pink Hair Lady, who was a badass 80-year-old grandma who wore a tasseled leather jacket who had bright pink hair. Then there was the campervan couple, who used to drive a really cool campervan with bright orange flowers painted on it. You get the idea. Creepy artist man, though. He gave most of the young girls weird vibes. He wore a straw hat, was in his late 40s, and had round gold trimmed glasses, and would wear strange graphic shirts with naked women, or professional pussy patrol written on them. He always wore ripped jeans where his knees were always hanging out of them, which were perpetually dirty with paint or mud. He had this strange half smile that would never leave his face, and a kind of leer that made people uncomfortable. He would take off his glasses and clean them constantly, which made you feel like he was trying to get a better look at the girls who worked there, especially the younger ones. Anyway, it was a roasting hot summer's day, and I had gratefully accepted the job of watering the hanging baskets outside where I could avoid the humid, sweaty heat of the greenhouses. I was wearing black shorts and my red polo, as well as my tool belt to prune deadhead plants as I went. With the hose in my hand and sunglasses on my face, I was busy, but enjoying the solitary job at the quietest part of the garden center. Well, hello there. Out of practically nowhere, he slipped out behind some wooden trellises and looked me up and down smiling with his weird, two small teeth. His eyes lingered on me for what felt like an uncomfortable few seconds, and I turned off my hose and asked him if he needed anything. He shook his head and kind of shrugged, still smirking at my legs. Okay, sir, have a nice day. Let me know if you need anything. And I continue and turn to carry on watering. I've never seen you here. Are you new? Huh? Me? Oh, well, I've been here about eight months now. I must have missed the memo that a beauty like you started. You have a nice tan. You look young. Oh, thanks. I'm 23. Anyway, I have to get back to work. Nice to meet you, Casey. I suddenly remembered my name badge and got slightly irritated that he knew my full name. 
I made a beeline for the smoking area where the tool shed was as an excuse to grab some smaller gardening gloves. And by the time I returned to the floor, fortunately, he had left. As the weeks went by, he would come into the store often, usually mid-afternoon coincidentally, or so I thought, as it was around the time I started my shift. Most of the time, I was the only cashier, so I would have to serve him. He would buy the most smallest, pointless things, like floristry wire or a tiny bag of birdseed. It seemed like he would make a purposeful purchase with the intention of interacting with me. He would make comments about my appearance, statements mostly like, you have your hair different today. Yesterday you had it down. You have new glasses. That's a different lip color to yesterday. He would always announce my name loudly and deliberately during every interaction. I felt uncomfortable, but I was 23 and just politely shrugged it off. Around Christmas time, I was decorating the artificial trees and he cornered me in the forest at the very back of the store. He jumped out from behind and made me jump, to which I was kind of pissed about him doing because I dropped a glass ornament and it shattered. He bent down and tried to help in grabbing my wrist and telling me not to touch the glass. His grip was scarily tight and forceful and his hands were clammy and gross. I slipped my hand out of his grip and asked if I could assist him with anything. That's when things got weird. He pulled out a leaflet from his back pocket and told me he was an artist and had a Christmas art show happening at the local church hall and he wanted me to go with him. He told me that he was a painter and he thought that I would enjoy his work. I had never indicated any interest in art to him or anyone else for that matter, which is why I thought this request in particular was a bit bizarre. I asked him if he wanted me to pin the leaflet to the local events board, and he reached out and touched my arm and said, No, the invitation is specifically for you. He pointed his finger and jabbed it into my breast and said, You. So I'm standing there in the dark corner of the store, obscured from view by artificial Christmas trees, and just kind of cornered by this guy who was touching me. I cringed away and said that I was busy with my boyfriend that day and I kind of scampered away. I remember feeling really strange after that. The fact he grabbed my wrist and jabbed my finger into my chest the way he did. I told a few of my colleagues about it and they all told me that they would warn me next time he was in the store and that maybe I could just hang out in the storeroom until he left. Well, that memo must have missed a few of the temporary Christmas staff, because one day I get told by one of them, your friend is asking for you at the tills. It wasn't unusual for my friends to stop by, as it was a fairly popular place for gifts. So thinking it was maybe my ex's mother or something, I head to the till, and there he is. He's holding a piece of paper. I cringe, but he had seen me now. So I walk over and ask what he needs from me. He passed the paper over and asked me to open it. Folded up was a drawing of me with exaggerated breasts and cartoon-like eyes, watering the hanging baskets in a very sexual kind of position. I kind of stood there and said thank you, but I couldn't keep it as I thought it was inappropriate to take gifts from customers. I handed it back to him and he kind of looked at me with this angry state. He turned around and left without another word. By this point, I'd had enough. I knocked on my manager's door and told him about the whole scenario that had just occurred and all the previous interactions I had had with him over the past year. He watched the CCTV and agreed that it was so strange the way he gave me the gross picture and told me he would talk to him if he ever came back. He praised me for my reaction to his advances and said I was doing the right thing 
and he would try and see him off next time. The next day was a Sunday, and I was not due in at work. My boss calls me and tells me he just received a call from HQ, stating that an anonymous caller had called in to report a member of staff inappropriately coming onto a customer. The staff member they had described and named was me. The caller had said that I had been inappropriate towards him at work, offered to sleep with him, and had led him on, and obviously been promiscuous, and that I had been pursuing him for over a year. The jerk even described a fictitious relationship we had, and ranted loudly about how I had been cheating on my boyfriend before hanging up. HQ luckily didn't believe a word, as my manager had already mentioned the guy to one of the higher-ups, but they thought it was wise to let me know about this crazy guy, and suggest that I report it into the police. The next day I did just that. The officer I spoke to said that he matched the description of a man who was a local pest, someone who often harasses young girls in the local area, and was also known to stalk girls in his car and had attempted to abduct a young woman not four years ago. The police officers assured me they would file a report and talk to him officially, and that he was not allowed in the garden centre or anywhere near me again, and if he did, I was to call the police and he would be arrested. Unfortunately though, it never stopped him sending a ranting letter to my workplace, addressed it to me, saying he would kill himself if I didn't take him back and received the gift he drew for me. Fortunately, the police saw this as an unsolicited contact, and he was thankfully arrested. I've had my Instagram for about five years. I post pretty simple photos, ones of me, and I'm a photographer and artist, so a good amount of pictures that I take as well. I don't have a large following on Instagram, so considering this started about four years ago, I probably had around 2,000 followers, and most of them were friends, family, or friends of friends. One day I posted a screenshot on my private Instagram of someone randomly viewing my story. I'm not sure what the context was, but it doesn't really matter. Soon after, a friend of mine pointed out that one of the Instagram accounts that was viewing my story, had a profile picture that was a photo of my friend, so I immediately went to their account. I noticed that all of their pictures were once screenshotted from my account, and I immediately began freaking out. They went by a kind of Russianized version of my name, and had about a thousand followers. I was baffled. This account didn't last that long and was receiving probably more activity than my own. I was confused, but I also knew that that was what happens when you have a public Instagram, and some catfish isn't going to ruin my life, so I reported it and moved on. Soon after, I started getting messages from random Instagram accounts that all seemed to be coming from Russia. They would send me messages and screenshots of different accounts, that also all seemed to be in Russian, of people pretending to be me. I started to panic more, and I knew that not only was it not just one person, but that many people knew about it, and genuinely thought that I was a completely different person than I was. I kept reporting these accounts, and they would mysteriously delete, and then show up again under new names. But at this point, my Instagram account was blocked, by pretty much all of the catfish accounts. I logged into a friend's Instagram. I noticed tagged photos of the catfish of me. Drawings, many drawings, people drawing me, who they totally thought was some random Russian girl. There was a Twitter account, a YouTube account, a VK, which is a Russian-based social media account, a Facebook account, all under this fake name and using pictures of me. I finally got a lot of fake accounts to be deleted, and felt relieved. Then, probably about six months later, I got another message on Instagram for some other random Russian account, sending me to yet another fake profile, 
pretending to be from me. The first thing that stuck out to me was the fact that they had a photo of my mum from when I was a baby. A photo that was only available on my mum's Facebook, which was not public. I panicked, reported the account, and told all of my friends to do the same. Then I got curious. I started wondering who these people were, and where they were finding these accounts. I went deep back into my Instagram DMs, and found that these accounts were also now catfishes of me. I don't know what part of me thought that it would be a good idea to message them, but I did, and I ended up having a very long conversation with them. What they told me was that they used the photos of me because I looked like them, and they were very self-conscious. They even said that they show their family photos of me and pretend it's them. One day, I tried to log into my Instagram, and it said something in Russian, that someone had made numerous attempts to reach my password. It was insane. Basically, I'll save the time and effort, and say that this went on for another three years, happening randomly every six months. Finally, there was one account made using my own name. I was so furious and had completely given up, and a few of my friends messaged them and told them to delete the account. They then DM'd me, apologized in broken English, and then decided that they were going to turn their account into a fan page. Again, not super weird. I even got to a point where I was considering calling up the producers of Catfish or something, literally anything. The fan page was running for about three months, but it seemed to me that they had deleted it. I still get weird messages from Russian accounts that seem too similar to the others, but I don't feel freaked out by it anymore. This whole situation sucks because I was never directly threatened or put in a situation in which I felt like my life was in danger, so I couldn't go to the police. But there were definitely times when I felt like I was being watched too closely, or for someone who was not famous or anything near it. Not really sure how to end this, because it may never do it, but I hope to never meet you again. I broke up with my long-term girlfriend not too long ago, and that is what led me to online dating. It can be hard for a girl who's interested in girls to find people online. I never had much experience before, or much faith in the system itself. And when I tried all those years ago, I got no results. So that left me bitter and with very little optimism. However, whilst on there, I was talking to a number of people. Not all of them was I interested in. Some of them I saw as only friends for the time being. There was this one really nice girl called Carol. She and I would always chat until it became a regular thing. I was excited and asked to meet her. Apparently we didn't live too far away. There was a city in between both of us that was roughly equidistant and we could meet there one Saturday afternoon, I suggested. She said that she would, and so, that Saturday, I got all dressed up and made my way there. It was about a 45 minute drive, and I was getting butterflies in my tummy, because I really liked this girl, and I hoped that she liked me too. I sat down in the restaurant parking lot, waiting for her Toyota Prius to arrive, but it never did. Getting frustrated and concerned, I resorted to messaging her via the app to see if everything was alright and that she hadn't had an accident. I didn't receive a reply and went home very disheartened. It wasn't until the next day in the evening did she send me a message. She told me that she had gotten into a horrific car crash and that she wouldn't be able to walk again. I was horrified. I'd met such a nice person for this horrific thing to befall her just because of me wanting to see her, and I felt incredibly guilty. She told me that she would be in touch, and I didn't hear from her for a few weeks. When she got back online, 
she told me that she had an excellent physiotherapist and that she was now back on her feet, despite her telling me before that the doctor said she would never be able to move again and that she was paralyzed. I tried to dismiss this and told myself that she was probably exaggerating before and that I should just let it go. After chatting for a few more days and making sure she felt comfortable, I even volunteered myself to go all the way over to her city and meet her there, maybe somewhere local for her, just to get her know her in person. She jumps at the offer and agrees, and so I start preparing myself for the date next weekend. That day rolls around, and this time I am very, very excited. We've spoken a lot more and I genuinely feel like she's someone I can have a very strong connection with. I turn up at the cafe we'd agreed on and wait. I message her to check if she's coming and receive no response again. I wait a few more hours and at this point I'm wondering if she didn't exist. This is getting too good to be true. The same as before, I get no reply. And the next day she tells me that as she was making her way she got a call from her mother that her father had had a heart attack. So she had to rush back home two states away to make sure that he was okay. And although he suffered a minor stroke, he was fine. I was beginning to get uncomfortable now. I feel like she was lying to me, but I really was getting on fantastically. So for the final time, I gave her the benefit of the doubt. We agreed again to meet one final time in the city in between ours. This time, I didn't doll up as much as before. I just kind of threw on some jeans and a top, didn't even apply that much makeup, and made my way casually, not wanting to arrive early in case disappointment. When I turn up, to no one's surprise, she isn't there. I don't receive a message. And unlike the other two times, something tragic and horrific didn't come through my letterbox during the next few days. I didn't message her. I was pissed. And the least she could have done if something had happened is send me a message for standing me up. I wait and eventually I get a message on Facebook from someone I don't know called Patrick. He says that he really likes me and asks if I'm bi. I ask him who the hell he is and wonder why he's asking such a weird question. He then openly admits that he's been catfishing me the entire time. I get so angry. I type out the most horrific and obscene things he played me. He messed with my time, messed with my emotions, and I thought I was having a real connection with someone. And it was all just a sick fantasy for him, in order for him to laugh at my expense. I wanted to report it to the police, but I don't think they'd do anything for this kind of stuff. I was deflated and didn't use online social media again. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's instalment of Catfish Stories. If you like this video, please don't forget to drop a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. It always is very much appreciated. Something else you can do is subscribe if you're new here and press the bell icon for nightly stories. That's pretty awesome. If there's a story you wish to share, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my reddit. Either are fine. But anyway, for now guys I'm gonna sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.